Now I'd like to introduce our, two, our new friends here, uh, Levi and Christy Scott. Uh, they are newly, fairly newly graduated from Anderson University, uh, fairly newly married this year, right? Yeah, uh, and uh, they are um, at our Wheaton Church, and Levi works in youth ministries, director yeah. of the youth ministries, and Christy works in social media and young adult ministries. Uh, um, welcome them. Uh, you guys are among friends. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, good morning. Can everyone hear me? All right. I'm used to speaking to a lot of middle schoolers who are a lot louder than all of you. So if anyone has problems hearing me, uh, I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> so like uh, Joe said, we've been working with One Church for a while now. Um, since we got married, we've been working there. But I actually grew up in the church, so it's pretty special to me. Um, as Joe said, my name is Christy. Um, I did not grow up particularly at um, One Church Wheaton, but um, my parents are pastors in the Church of God movement, and um, I have lived in the ministry my whole life. And so when I felt the calling into some form of ministry, which kind of ministry, I'm still not even sure. So <laughs> it's just kind of wherever God ends up placing me, that's the ministry I'm going to work with. Um, so today, oh, if I could it. get myself a little more organized, <laughs> we're very thankful to be with all y'all today. And today we want to share something pretty special to us um, that's been on our hearts for a while. It's actually a major reason why both of us decided to end up going for the ministry. And basically, the big thing for us in searching out God and seeking where we want to go, where God's leading us in every moment, has always been where can God best use us? Where can we best show ministry, love, and outreach to people who don't know God or people whose hearts are really turned against God? And so today we're going to share a little bit about that with you. Okay, quick question. How many of you would classify yourselves as outgoing people? Okay. I am not one of those people. I am, I am a very shy person. When I enter a new atmosphere, typically what I like to do is I like to hide in the back corner and observe everything until I feel comfortable enough to step out and be myself. That's not what God called us to do, though. God called us to go forth and be bold and to reach out to people. So in the past couple of years, oops, sorry about that, I keep hitting my mic. In the past couple of years, One Church has been going through a season of growth. Um, a few years ago, we didn't have many new members coming into the church very often. We didn't have a lot of outreach ministries, and we weren't nearly as present in our community as we have been today. So um, our scripture today is about outreach, but it's not what you'd expect. Typically what you expect when you hear outreach, you think Jesus and the 12 disciples and Jesus' 30 years of ministry. But we're actually going to be reading out of 1 Samuel chapter 24, and we are going to be talking about David and Saul. So it's kind of interesting this morning when you're talking about David and God calling him to be more. Right, so... Oh, perfect. So, as many of you know, David had a heart turned towards God at all moments. David loved the Lord his God. However, his predecessor, Saul, not so much. In the end of his rule, he had more of a vacillating or kind of flippant personality. He was constantly seeking to do his own way, trying to keep his kingdom rather than following what God said. And for this reason... God decided that Saul was no longer fit to be king. So David and Saul have an interesting relationship. We'll put it that way. Um, their relationship begins in 1 Samuel chapter 17, where we 
meet David as he's battling Goliath, trying to put on Saul's armor, even though Saul is probably about twice his size. Um, and their relationship spans through the rest of 1 Samuel into chapter 31, where Saul ends up taking his own life in the midst of a battle. Um, their relationship has a lot of interesting factors. Um, there is trust, there's betrayal, there's broken promises, there's war, all sorts of things. Um, their relationship, in a sense, has more twists than a modern day Hollywood trilogy, I guess. Um, <laughs> but the key theme in their relationship in the chapters that we're going to be reading today is Saul's anger. Saul is very angry, not necessarily with David, but with the fact that he's losing control of his reign over Israel. Right, and so one of the major things, can everyone hear me? Yeah, you're fine. Okay, perfect. So one of the major things is that today we're going to talk about the Lord's favor being upon David, but having left Saul. And this is super apparent to everyone in the kingdom of Israel. I mean, they even would talk about David and Saul when they came back from their battles and say, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. And for Saul, this was a big hit to his pride. I mean, he had been the king. He was the guy who formed the whole nation of Israel as one kingdom and was the only king forever. And now there's this new guy who's just a servant, a shepherd boy, coming in, kind of taking over everything, and everyone loves him. And, you know, this guy's also his daughter's wife or husband, which is kind of an awkward thing for Saul. And so it's just really, really difficult. And we see that especially through chapters 18 through 24, Saul just goes off the deep end. And Saul chases David out of the city. He goes and kills all of the priests at Nob, and then he slaughters the entire city. So, you know clearly no longer following God's will. Now, David was on the run, and you know he and his men were going into hiding in caves. They were preparing for a fight. They were running. They were scared, and they didn't really know what to do. So we find them this way in chapter 24, and verse number 4 reads like this. The men found... Well, first off, the men had found... Saul coming into the cave, and he was there to relieve himself. And so all of the men are talking to David, and they're like, what should we do? So then they say, this day the Lord spoke of when he said, to you I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. So you see, all of his men are sitting here talking to David and conspiring with him. Hey, look. This guy who we've been running from for months, this guy who's going to kill you and all of us if he finds us, he's here and you finally have this opportunity. Go take it. Go kill him. But David doesn't listen to the voice of his men. He doesn't listen to the voice of Israel who's singing his praises, not the praises of their king. He instead chooses to listen to that still small voice. Afterward, David was conscious stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. Then David went out to the cave and called out to Saul, My Lord, the king. Then Saul looked behind him. David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, Why do you listen to men when they say, David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I will not lift my hand against my master, because he is the Lord's anointed. This speaks a lot to God's mercy. And it speaks a lot to how David's heart was in tune with God. Because he very easily could have listened to his men, listened to the words of the world, and taken Saul's life and become king right there. 
but that's not what God had planned. And David prostrated himself. He got down on his knees, which is not a place you put yourself when you are in battle against someone. You are putting yourself at a disadvantage. What David was demonstrating when he prostrated himself before Saul was that I'm not here to hurt you. I am not going to raise my hand against you, but not only that, I am going to trust God to judge between me and you. In verse 12, we hear him even say that, May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. He is trusting in God to protect him from the harms that Saul would do to him because he knows God has a plan and a purpose for his life as well as Saul's. It's interesting the positions God will put us in when we're in the face of an enemy. You know, Jesus says, turn the other cheek. We don't, as human beings, typically think of the first response to someone wanting to harm us as, okay, I'm going to make myself vulnerable. And by the way, do you love Jesus? But that's what God calls us to. You know, one of the big things for a lot of the students and people who we work with is showing them love. A lot of our students aren't churched. A lot of the people we've worked with in the past haven't really gone to church or even have bad memories of church. And so the biggest obstacle we face is they're defensive. And the easiest way, as Christy was saying, for someone who's defensive, who's already wanting to fight you, who's scared of you, who wants to hurt you, for you to make them not so defensive, not so angry, not so scared, is to put yourself in a position as lower than them, to bow yourself down, to humble yourself and say, I'm going to let God deal with you, and I'm not going to make myself the priority here. And just like that, David does this. And this isn't a person who loves God. Saul, at this point, had killed the priests, like we said. You know, he slaughtered an entire city of Israel. I mean, that's not a great king. Yet still, God pursues mercy for Saul. Just like the Saul of the New Testament, God loves his creation, even when his creation is doing exactly what he's commanded them not to do. And that is one thing that God still fights for. God still seeks for us to show mercy to those people who do not love him. David could have easily fought or fleed. Our natural instinct, as we talk a lot about when we talk about the science of our minds, is fight or flight. It would have been very easy for David to go and kill Saul. There's even another part where Saul is again chasing David. And instead of just cutting off the corner of his robe, this time David goes into the middle of the camp. Saul is surrounded by soldiers that could easily have woken up and, and rang the alarm and said, Saul, he's here, take your chance. But David went in, he took his spear and his water jug, and he went back out. He did not lay one hand on Saul. He did not even touch his robe. He picked up those two things, and he walked out. And the next morning, he called out again to Saul and said, look, I'm not here to harm you. And there's this constant back and forth between David and Saul because Saul is fighting these demons and the same demons that we fight. God gives us mercy. He gives us grace. He gives us forgiveness, compassion, and love. And that is what David chose. We today have that same choice. We face people in the workplace, in a world, in our communities that we don't necessarily agree with, we don't like, we have arguments. And I, yep. But there are times when we hate our enemies. And we are called to be better than that. Amen. We are called to show love, forgiveness, mercy, grace, compassion. Amen. And if we don't do those things, we're just as bad as Saul. And, you know, we talked a little bit about our church, One Church, and some of the things we've been seeing um, since being there and since coming back 
In the past two years, the church has begun tons of new ministries. We started homeless ministries where we partnered up with a local organization that seeks to end homelessness in our community. We've been growing the youth group as Christy and I personally work with students who don't know Jesus. Uh, just this weekend, we had eight students out for an all-nighter, which, trust me, if any of you have middle schoolers, you all know, they can stay up way later than any of us adults. <laughs> I, yep, exactly. <laughs> so, it was a long night, a lot of stressful situations, a lot of, I want this, I want that, there's not enough of this, where's that, when are we going to get to this? But we had a great moment where we sat down, all of our students, and you know, it takes a while because they're all rowdy, and we said, hey, um, we're going to do devotional. So we had the former youth leader come in, and he gave the devotional for that night. And then afterwards, I was talking to them all, and it probably took 15 minutes to get them seated again, maybe, maybe 20. But we did, and then we said, all right, we need each of you to come up and share something about what you thought about tonight. You know, what do you think about Jesus? Who is Jesus? You know, some of these kids, they maybe went to church when they were little, but don't anymore. Some of their parents had come to our church for a month or two and then left. And, you know, the great thing was there was only one boy there that night, and I kind of pick on him because he's usually the only boy who shows up. But I said, hey, Austin, come up here, and I want you to share one thing about who Jesus is to you. Now, Austin hasn't been to church in probably five, six months. And he comes up there, and he's thinking about it, you know. And then a lot of people are rowdy, and he says, you know, I think that Jesus is just love. And he hands me back the microphone and runs off stage. But the great thing is that, you know, a lot of people who don't know Jesus, who might seem angry or afraid, or even, you know, for us adults who go into a workplace and go out and have coworkers who openly don't agree with Jesus and don't agree with our faith, even though they might seem scary or it might be intimidating to talk to them, when you just talk to them about Jesus, when we just share our love for our Savior, it overflows and they see that. Austin's only experiences of church have been those two months he came with his mom and then the few times he's come to youth group, but he still knows that Jesus is love. There's another girl who's in our youth group and her family doesn't go to church. But when we asked her, what do you think of when you think of Jesus? Her answer struck me to the core because it tells me that she's listening, that she's paying attention. So even when you don't think they are, whether it's an adult or whether it's a child, keep speaking it because they are listening whether you think it or not. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're just the seed planter. Maybe you just plant the seed in their heart and it's somebody else's job to grow them. Some people are only in our lives for a season, but we have to make the most of the season that we are given. God has given us the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20, he tells us, he calls us to go and preach the gospel to every nation, to every people of every tongue. That doesn't just mean the people we like. That doesn't just mean your neighbor who's next door and you both go to church together. That means those kids who are disrupting the classroom. That means that coworker who's always causing problems. And that means that person closest to you who doesn't go to church, who slams at you when you even bring up the name of Jesus or the title of the church. Keep preaching it because they are listening whether you believe it or not. You know, it's amazing to see just how wonderful God's kingdom is, especially when we're including the broken. Right now at our church, we have so many people in our youth group who 
don't know Jesus that well, whose parents don't go to church with us. But we also have people in our church who haven't fully committed to Christ. Um, mm -hmm. There's one young couple who I talk with regularly, and we want to meet with soon, but uh, they just had a baby, so it's kind of difficult for them planning out when they can meet. But every time they come to church, they're like, wow, this place is so amazing. I can't believe how happy you all are. I can't believe how much you all love each other. Like, I just didn't think that was possible for people. And that's the good news. That's the gospel that we all have in our hearts. And that's what we carry with us every day. And that's what we represent as Christians. That love, that place where people can go and come and be at home and be a part of a family. And, you know, it's okay for people to come into the church and not really know who Jesus is. It's okay for them to come and be new because... In the early Christian movement, you know, the apostles were going around preaching, but there were still people who were like, okay, that sounds pretty cool. Wait, so like, what happens afterwards? And you know, that's why Paul's writing letters. He's telling people, hey, you're part of the Christian movement. This is what it looks like. Hey, I'm writing these for instruction and teaching so that you'll know what to do. And that's part of who we are as Christians today. We carry on that message. We keep talking and we keep preaching the gospel, and we keep going out to our neighbors, to people who don't know us. You know, just this morning we were talking with someone who felt like they had a new calling, and praise God, because every time, you know, God is spoken, or the word of God is spoken, or God provides a miracle, that's something we can share. That's something we can go out as the community into our places, into our neighborhoods, and go say, hey, look, Jesus loves you, and so do I. We want you to know that, and we want to come together and pray for you and be there for your family. You know, one church is an amazing place, and I've loved it all my life. And in the last two years, it's doubled in its membership since starting new ministries, since reaching out into the community. We've started a food pantry, and we used to have one, but it was never used. Now we have people coming every week, and they come from all around because we give free food out. And we've actually talked to some people, and several of them have started coming to our church. They've started attending, and they're becoming new members. It's wonderful to see just how transformed lives become. Just from we don't have any place to be, we don't have a means of providing food, to hey, we're the church, we'll step up and do that for you. Let's help you. Let's come alongside you. And so today, our challenge is we want to encourage all of you to keep preaching, to keep going out and spreading the gospel. Because, you know, people get up here like us, and I think someone said it earlier, we're just regular people. This is a regular building. The only thing that's really making this time special is God. Amen. And the amazing thing is, since it's not the building, since it's, not anything physical. God goes with each of us every week. And each of us can carry that word into the ends of the earth. And I think the biggest thing that we can all remember is that Jesus was all about plugging into his immediate community. No matter where he was, it didn't matter if he had just got done preaching on one shore and went in a boat all night to another shore and thousands of people showed up the next day at the break of dawn to greet him, he would preach. And so our lives, I think we can all orient them more and more towards that constantly preaching of the gospel. And keep listening to that still small voice. Whether it's a name that pops in your head and you know they don't go to church, if they're not in your, <laughs> if they won't hear your voice if you speak out at that moment, then get on your knees and pray. Because you never know what that person may be going through. It may be that God put their name in your head because they just got into a car accident. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they just lost a relative. God gives you names in your heart for a reason. Speak their names in love. And pray for God to breach the walls of their heart. Mm. And uh, one more thing before we close. Something we did as a church, 
think just a little before Christy and I got here, was a group called My One. Um, it's about taking one name and you just write it down on a piece of paper, roll that up, and what we did is we had like a little box and some things that we held it at the front of our little worship area for service. And everyone would come up and just put their one name in. And the thing is, you basically pray for that person and you follow up with them. You try to meet with them. And that's your goal for basically forever. You just pray and meet with them. And it's always up in our church. And I think the thing that's special about that is it keeps us reminded that we have people we need to pray for. And we have people we want to follow up with. You know, my mom's my one is way out in Virginia. And the funny thing is, it's an old coworker, an old friend, and she was like, man, I don't know how I'm going to be able to always talk with this person very easily, how I'm going to reconnect. But all the time she's trying. And the funniest thing is that that my one actually now has helped with the church plan, which is amazing. So God can work incredible things just through small, tiny interactions. Thank you all for having us here today. We love you all. And as co-family in the Wesleyan Church, we just want to say it's an honor and a blessing to be here.